We got real problems. What's up, Mena Nerds? This video will be a complete breakdown of the Scorponek Annihilator droid. Seeing who built it, how it works, its history and variants that excelled in killing clones and enemies of the Pikes, and end on some behind the scenes facts. But first, I want to thank this video's sponsor, Keeps. Guys, did you know that two thirds of men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they reach 35? Keeps is the hair loss company to work with since they let you work with doctors from the comfort of your home. You'll chat with them online and they'll review your situation and make the right recommendations for you, with the product being shipped out every three months. And keep in mind that prevention is key, that all treatments like this take four to six months to take effect, so act as quickly as you can. Don't wait until it's too late. And they have generic versions of FDA approved medications that make it a lot more affordable. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss today, go down to keeps.com slash metanerds or click on the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash metanerds. This story starts in the inner rim system of Kala, the tropical homeworld of the Kalakoid, the cannibalistic bugs that were an interesting combo of being incredibly brilliant engineers, with a very sophisticated culture, but also ruthlessly protective of their queen. You don't have to get far into your hollow history book before you see everything descends into a near constant state of war across the countless species over every region of the galaxy. But the Colicoids were so efficient at devouring any alien visitors, and their overall insectoid look helped to add to their horrifying legend. So we don't have any reports of war coming to Kala, but their creations would play a major role in the galaxy's largest conflicts. Starting with the Sith war droid used by the Sith Empire, most famously used by Darth Malgus during the Battle of Alderaan, and then later seen stomping through the Republic capital during the decisive final blow of the Great Galactic War, 3,653 years before the Battle of Yavin. This design can be seen as a prototype for the Droidica and Scorponek, and in its first iteration we see it possesses the overall shape, a pair of dual laser cannon arms, though no shield generators yet. Overall, these were a huge success, partially due to the Colicoids basing its design on their own biology. It's funny to think that these are the equivalent of humanoid Terminator-like droids for these bugs, Coliconoid in shape if you will using the billions of years of research and development trials carried out by evolution to reason that if colicoids could scale the difficult terrain of rocky mountainous regions and dense jungles of their homeworlds, this design should work for the droid as well. And Darth Malgus and his generals reported back that this thing worked as advertised, across the vastly different terrains of a galaxy-spanning campaign. And it would be seen as important in both the history of war and the history of droids. And even thousands of years later, we see one in the wreck belt of Lotho Minor around 1 ABY, owned by a man that was described by Dr. Afra as one who would, quote, take a dozen tin cans and turn them into a Death Star, but he'd sell his own mother into slavery to pay for the next fancy gizmo. He has tons of Clone Wars droids like B1s and P2s, and other stuff that I don't recognize. And really interesting is something that looks like either a Droidica variant or something Frankenstein with the lower part of a Droidica, cobbling together parts of other droids, along with a Sith war droid antique. And he actually has several of them. The Colicoid Creation Nest would follow this creation up with the Eradicator series battle droid, which has the overall same body design, and would be the first to introduce a personal shielding system. After the Cold War and through to the apparent destruction of the Sith, the Colicoids kept improving their creations and selling them to anyone that wanted them. And by around 50 BBY, the private military forces that would eventually form into the CIS in the following decades would buy up the bug's greatest hits, the Drosh boarding ship, Tri-Fighter, Trident assault ship, and Protodeca, down to droids like the FLTCH that appears to be influenced by their insectoid competitors on Geonosis, looking like a variant of B1 and B2 battle droids. And then down to the smaller sabotage droids, the Infiltrator, that would covertly burrow into a ship, seal that hole, and then proceed to assassinate the entire crew with vibroblades and small blasters. While the Pastoika or Buzz droids would swarm on starfighters to rip them apart, and the rarer Hunter Seeker droid which operated as a small droid starfighter. The sales of these droids was facilitated by a Mune Banker and secret Sith Lord, Higo Damask, aka Darth Plagueis. But the three that were the most similar in this era were the Droidica, T4, and Scorponek. In that order, they were 1.83 meters or 6 feet tall, then up to 2.5 meters or 8 feet, with the Scorponek at 3.5 meters or 11.5 feet. The T4 turret droid replaced the arms with spinning blaster cannons, presumably to allow the barrels to cool between shots while still having a high rate of fire something like a Gatling gun, while it also had a grenade launcher. 
All three of them would have shield generators, and the smallest was of course the lightest and quickest, the droidica hitting decent speeds using this roly-poly method, which was based on the colicoid biology. The bugs would curl up to roll through the jungle paths. These three units would work excellently together. In a battle, the droidicas would work like frontline troops, zipping forward, popping up their shields, and destroying infantry, while the larger and more defensive T4 turrets would spread out in overlapping areas, making sure to secure the land gained by the droidicas and prevent any counterattacks. These T4s could also be modified to act as spotters for the Scorponek, or to operate as a listening post or patrol the camp. With a long enough campaign, I'd expect the general to have all the varieties possible for different stages. With the two brothers in the front, the Scorponek would hold down the rear, being intended to act in an anti-vehicle role, taking down both enemy tanks and aircraft. Which is the logical rationale behind the inaccuracies of the Scorponek when trying to shoot down individual people, but of course this is also due to the space-time bending properties that are worked into plot armor. But the real genius of this line of droids is their shields. Each of their shields phased at the same frequency, meaning they could walk into each other's shields, overlap the shields, and allow the droidicas to take refuge under the big brother. You can actually see how this works when the shields start to fail. This glitch-like flickering showing the shield generators trying to maintain the pattern, or lines that work something like a key. Things energized the right way could pass in and out, while everything else would be stopped. The energy bolts shot by the droids were also fired with the same frequency key, if you will, while the shield for the Scorponek had an additional layer. Think of it like a droidica shield combined with a ray shield, in the sense that, like we saw with Palpatine's rescue on Grievous' flagship, it wasn't just about blocking energy or being solid. It wasn't how fast or slow you moved. They were simply stuck due to the type and strength of this containment field. With the Droidica, we saw that as the war progressed, the Republic found that you could roll something like an ion grenade through the shielding if it passed slow enough. What the shields don't stop are slow or stationary objects. They're designed to absorb them, so nothing hinders their movement. But both due to the size and the fact that the Scorponek could engage a particle or solid blocking layer like a ray shield, meant that with the Scorponek, that layer would have to be weakened first. Mando is partly right in basing this off his experience with other droids. Our energy weapons can't get through and our kinetic weapons have too much velocity. But even if you move slowly, like we saw with Black Chrysanthemum, nothing like the Gungan shield that the droids pass through on Naboo, or like the gently rolled grenade. He has to blast it a whole bunch of times, with a weapon that we've seen do incredible things, sending people flying through the air. His great size and strength allowing him to walk around with something equivalent to a 50 cal rifle. So this enormous energy dump at one spot and at close range worked to mess with the frequency of the ion lock, allowing him to work his hand through even if it wasn't the right key. And we see a couple very interesting things with the droid's response. Black does get the tip of his fingers through, but this perturbation in the shield is detected, and it shows that it can redirect the shield to strengthen a damaged area. Notice the reddish hue when the shield is weakened, and how the blue shifts to the spot the droid wants. We see this again after it was attacked by the Rancor, that with the shields heavily damaged overall, it directs more shield power to face the threat, leaving the back red and weaker. With Chrysanthemum, you can see that this shift is just barely a second before it is able to get everything balanced out back to a uniform coverage. But with the Rancor attack, it stays red from then on out, allowing Din Djarin to break through with now just a few Darksaber blows. This is a really cool touch because it means that working with a droid this large, the Colicoids made the shields work more like a starfighter, where the pilot could focus the shielding to more protect the area they expected to be shot from. On double front. Another cool thing to notice, now that the shield is explained, is how you see a natural tendency for the pikes to want to take refuge behind the giant shielded scorpion. But they can't pass through the shield either, so they can't take advantage of that incredible feature which allowed the Colicoid soldiers, or the Troidica, to be able to tuck in whenever it was facing a line of fire. We can also deduce that the power supply for the shield generator is located right behind the eye, as this stab does keep the shield down, but it can still walk, the computers are fine, and it's still able to fire, as you see it just gets a bolt off as it is snatched up by the Rancor. So the power source must have been behind the eye, but the actual shield generator was located in the base. Other things I want to note is that this belt feeds power to the guns, and how we first saw the Scorponek through Mando's helmet is how the droid sees the rest of the world. The main eye is a series of infrared photoreceptors, while the smaller one is a composite radiation sensor, which sees in a way similar to the Colicoid's natural eye. 
by 9ABY during the time of Daimyo Fett, the Pikes had likely been purchasing Colicoid creations for decades. And despite the Empire's best efforts to monopolize on firepower, everyone from petty criminal to rebel leader was able to get their hands on some Clone Wars leftovers, which were impossible to fully destroy when you had a literal galaxy-spanning war with millions of units. We saw Thrawn faced rebels using buzz droids and droidicas, Vader was building a secret droid army, and so the Pikes, who only grew more powerful after the death of the entire Hut Council, certainly had enough ill-gotten credits to get whatever they wanted. The only reason we don't see more of the Scorpionek is because the Colicoids wanted to keep them to themselves, a little surprise secret unit that would defend their homeworld of Kala 4. And like most Colicoid designs, this worked perfectly. Republic Intel tracked the source of many of the deadliest droid opponents to this obscure world, and launched what was supposed to be a quick surgical strike to destroy their massive factories. And they thought they had seen every droid variant in the galaxy thrown at them by now. But as the capital ships carried out an orbital bombardment, four platoons of troopers, each with 41 troops, or 84 total, descended on gunships to infiltrate a heavily shielded factory. They made it through the exterior walls, but as they came up on the building, they were met with this never-before-seen droid variant, which sprung to life and opened up with the cannons. They were surrounded, and the Scorpionex bolts blasted through the walls the clones were trying to hide behind, eventually killing three-fourths of them. Arc Trooper Steck frantically called back to command, We don't know what it was, sir, but it took out three platoons. We can't let the Colicoids get these things off-planet. But that's exactly what would happen. The survivors were forced to scramble back to atmosphere and flee into Republic space. And the Colicoids figured that if the droid secret was out of the bag, and they were now being attacked on their homeworld, their strategy of keeping this card up their sleeve served its purpose, and now it was time to crank up production and send these out to the front lines to try and finally end this war. There had only been 100 of them planetside, placed around strategic and political centers. But now the Bugs would ask for a Separatist naval task force to set up an orbital screen over Call of 4, while freighters started taking these to the most active battlefronts, at this point being mostly in the Outer Rim, where Republic commanders lamented the fact that they had to dedicate a massive amount of forces to take down a single Annihilator, all due to that incredible shield. And it is reported that on average, one of these could quote, turn a dozen ATTEs into smoking husks leading to these units being credited with turning the tide of battle at Polani and Formos. Grievous was leading the Outer Rim sieges in order to draw Republic forces out of the core, so that he could carry out his Blitzkrieg on Coruscant. So it's funny to think that because of that Republic invasion on Call of Four, they inadvertently made it harder for themselves by drawing this tank killer out during the Republic's darkest hour. Luckily for the Republic, the game was rigged, and when Palpatine brought it all to a close, he made sure to have all Scorpion X's forces came across brought to the Imperial Department of Military Research, and then secretly moved to his private citadel in the Deep Core World, Biss. While all the criminals scrambled to buy up the Clone Wars weapons, droids, and vehicles stretched all across the stars. When they were deployed on Mos Espa, we saw how difficult it was to get through those shields, and you gotta remember that they know that they can't shoot through them. They're just hoping to keep them distracted by scrambling and shooting at them so that the AI is focused on them and not ripping apart the city. I think that the Pikes were afraid that Boba would use his infamous Slave 1, and hoped that the Scorpion X anti-aircraft ability would make quick work of it. And of course, the Rancor was able to overwhelm the shield's ability to repulse it, showing a similar issue with the Droidica when they fall on their side. Essentially, gravity, its own weight, and inertia proving too much force to repel, short-circuiting the shield generator, and it's the same idea for the one that was thrown into the building, unable to repel these thousands of pieces of rubble. And what's interesting is that their legacy did not end here. Legend has it that just one year later, Palpatine's hidden forces on Biss started producing the X-1 Viper a six-meter-tall blaster-and-grenade-firing beast that was well-protected behind a prototype molecular shielding that appears to be based on the Clone Wars droid relics stowed away on the world that the Emperor would plot his return from. So that's it for its breakdown, and as for behind-the-scenes facts, I'm sure this hurt, but it's cool to see that the Beskar could stop the droid's leg from stabbing into Mando. And Doug Chain works on the Book of Boba, who is the artist behind a lot of our favorite designs from the prequels, and he's worked on both The Mandalorian and Boba. He's responsible for a lot of the iconic designs we love, including the N1 Naboo fighter. While the lore comes from the books The New Essential Guide to Droids, The Essential Guide to Warfare, in The Art of Star Wars Episode 1. If you liked it, the best way to help me out is to just simply hit that like button, comment your thoughts down below, and share the video somewhere. And of course, subscribe if you want to see more. Check out the links down in the description for free audiobooks from Audible, and discounts on amazing metal print art from Displate. 
You also see our Patreon and PayPal. Special shout out to our patrons, especially our $25 tier, Bill Payne, Brandon Robinson, Oscar Jones, and Renee Flores. But most important of all, remember, there's always a bigger droid, and the Force will be with you, always. <laughs>